Hello, Destiny Kids. Welcome to week five of Where is God? Where we go on a treasure hunt to look for the greatest treasure of all time. I bet you already know what that is. So I greeted you as Destiny Kids. What are the Destiny Kids? What are the Destiny Kids? Destiny Kids. We are kids of value. So true. We have hope for the future. Yep. We are people of influence. Yeah. We are children of destiny. You have a destiny. God has a plan for your life. And that is why you are the Destiny Kids. On our journey through the thunderstorm of confusion, we are going to talk about how we can find God in nature. All the things that God created show us that he is there and show us that he is amazing, like trees. Look at all these leaves here. Does anybody know what kind of leaves those are? Just about every Canadian's gonna be able to name the one in the middle, right? That's a maple leaf. But these are just five leaves. There are thousands of different kinds of trees in the world, but we're going to talk about God's creation. Sometimes people get a little bit confused. Instead of looking at nature and praising God for the amazing things that they find in nature, sometimes people praise nature. There are people who will worship and praise things like trees. People who will praise animals. There are stories in the Bible about how sometimes the Israelite people, they got kind of caught up in that, where they were wandering from one place to another. They had a lot of times they were nomads where they just traveled around. And while they were traveling, they would encounter other groups of people from other nations. And those people would sometimes introduce the Israelites to the kinds of things that they worshipped. There's a story in the Bible about how one time the Israelite people were feeling a little bit lost. Well, they were lost. They were wandering in the desert. But Moses had gone up to a mountain to talk to God and he had left the Israelite people in the camp. And when they were in camp, the Israelite people started to feel like maybe Moses wasn't coming back or maybe God had left them. And so they asked the priests to craft, to build and create a God for them. So they had something to worship. We are, we are driven by a need to worship. That story in the Bible I was telling you about, the priests made them a cow out of gold. How could you go from worshiping the one true God, the creator of everything, to worshiping a golden cow? But you know, the truth is that they had that driving need. They had to have something to worship and that's what they got. So the thunderstorms, the, the thunderstorm of confusion is telling us about how sometimes instead of worshiping the God of creation, sometimes people worship creation itself. Rather than worshiping a tree, I'd rather worship the God who made the tree. And I hope you would too. So we're going to take Bible Child through the thunderstorm of confusion today and we're going to talk about how we can see God in creation and worship God but not worship creation itself. So every week we've been talking about treasures that people don't always think of as treasures, right? And every week I've been telling you about an extinct animal. This week is, a, is an interesting animal because they only think it's extinct. They're not actually even sure. It's called the Tasmanian tiger. From anybody have a guess where that might be found in the world? Yeah, Tasmania. Tasmania is a state of Australia. If you know where Australia is, you just look south of that and you have found Tasmania. The Tasmanian tiger is also sometimes known as the Tasmanian wolf. I'm not 100% sure that the Tasmanian tiger is extinct is because people still report seeing it. Here's the thing I think is really interesting about this animal. This animal is a marsupial. A marsupial is a mammal with a pouch that carries to carry a baby. 
And the really interesting thing about this marsupial is that not only does the female have a pouch for carrying her babies, but the male also has a pouch. But what is super interesting about this pouch, different from kangaroos and all other animals, is the pouch faces backwards. So let's say you see a mama Tasmanian tiger running through the forest and then you look and you're like, wait, I see her tail and there's eyes looking at me. What? Those are the eyes of the baby peeking out, looking behind her as she runs. We're able to breed some in zoos. That was fairly successful. Not all animals will, will breed in zoos, but the Tasmanian tiger did. There was a Tasmanian tiger in a zoo and when that Tasmanian tiger died in 1936, so we're in 2021, right? In 15 years, this animal will have been extinct for one century. So Australia tried cloning it. In 1999, they actually tried to clone from the Tasmanian tiger from cells that they had in old fossils and have not been successful yet. But who knows, as science advances, we may find someday the Tasmanian tiger will walk among us again. If you click on the link below the video, you will find the printout with the five leaves that I showed you earlier. You can cut them out if you want, which is what I did. I cut out all my leaves. And on each one, I'm going to write something in creation that makes me think of God. So for me, the first one is the moon. I love the moon especially a full moon. When I look out and the night is so bright because the moon is shining so brightly, I love that. I love the moon. And when I see the moon, I just feel amazed by God. Another thing in creation that makes me think of God would be like unusual kinds of animals. And you look at them and you're like, wow, no, nothing but the mind of God could have come up with that. I'm going to put as another thing that makes me think of God, I'm going to put unusual animals. When I see an unusual animal, I really see God's hand in that. Oh, another thing where I see God's hand is harvesting. I have a garden that I'm growing in my backyard and I'm growing so many different things. When it's time to pick something, like, like a little tomato for my garden, I just, I'm amazed by God. Sunsets. Oh, it's probably going to be on a lot of people's lists. And my last, boy, it's so hard to pick only five things in creation. Um, <laughs> okay. Another thing about creation that amazes me is the various states of matter. Liquids solids, gases, plasma. It's fascinating, especially when you consider that most things can exist in more than one state of matter. Like, for example, easiest one of all is water, right? Water can exist as a liquid, right? Drink it, it's water. But it also can exist as a solid, like ice. And it can exist as a gas, water vapor. So. I, I look at that, how things like rock can exist in different forms of matter, right? And, and I just think, wow, that's God's creation right there. That is an amazing thing about God, the various states of matter. Some people, I don't know what you're going to put on yours. You might put a favorite animal or a favorite tree or a favorite place like a waterfall, anything five things in creation that you can say, mm-hmm, I see God there. Write them down. All right, it is time for our greatest treasure of history. And this one's a little different. When I was studying great treasures, I found this one fascinating. This is considered to be the greatest party in thousands of years. In 1971, the Shah, decided to celebrate his birthday and at the same time to celebrate 2,500 years 
of Persian history. So the area that is now known as Iran used to be known as the Great Empire of Persia. The Great Empire of Persia has been in recorded history, 2,500 years. That's a very long time. We're talking 500 years before the birth of Christ. And the Shah decided that he was gonna celebrate 2,500 years of Persian history and his birthday at the same time. And this party was amazing. He set up 50 tents. Now, you might think, Poopty ding dong, I see 50 tents, wanna go to a campground. Ah, uh -uh, not this kind of tent. These tents were like luxury apartments. They were made of Persian cloth, traditional Persian cloth, and they were beautifully decorated and they are, were arranged in the shape of a star. He also decided that because the area where he decided to throw his party was at an ancient town called Persepolis and there are ruins of Persepolis in Iran. So the Shah decided that he would make this party just outside of those ruins to honor the Persian history. Now the problem with that is it's pretty much desert. So not a lot of great sights and very, very warm. So he decided to import trees and plants from France and had them established, had them planted around his tent city that he had made. So he created a green, lush, and beautiful environment, even though all around that there was desert. He also imported over 50,000 songbirds. He also made sure that any poisonous creature was taken out of that area so that his guests wouldn't have to worry about getting poisoned and die. Because let's face it, that makes a party a real downer when your guests are dying from snake bites. And he had 250 red Mercedes-Benz cars to transport people from the airport to the tent city and 600 limousines for transportation. There were 600 guests. I would say a five and a half hour banquet. He had a piece of music commissioned for the occasion. There were 18 tons of food. And on the final day, the Shah launched the Shahyad Tower, which was later renamed the Azadi Tower after the Iranians had the revolution. The tower also housed a museum of Persian history. Every king, queen, president, and prime minister from all six continents of the world were invited to this event. So, so the emperor of Ethiopia, which is an ancient dynasty, and the Shah of Persia were at this party. And 10 years later, neither one of those empires existed anymore. The Shah was overthrown by his people. Iran exists as a very different nation now. Here's our scripture wall beneath our map. This week we have, sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. That's First Chronicles 16, 23. And this, this week we have been talking about how we find God in creation. All the things that God has made. And when you look at them and you say, wow, I could never have done that. That is the hand of God. So I don't know how you guys are learning your scriptures, but a fun way to do it is to take something like this. Now this is a juggling ball, but maybe you have a hacky sack. And what you do is you, you can play by either tossing it and catching it. You can practice tossing and catching it with a different hand, tossing it over your shoulder, catching it. And while you do it, say your scripture. So remember this week we have sing to the Lord all the earth. Proclaim his salvation day after day. So kind of sing to, and then maybe go under your leg. The Lord, have maybe I'll roll it all. The earth proclaim and I'm like his salvation day. All right, let's go with day after day. 
first. Chronicles 16.23. So today, as we are traveling along our treasure map, we are talking about the thunderstorm of confusion and how a lot of people, a lot of people, instead of praising and worshiping God, they praise and worship the things he's made. And it's not actually that unusual. It may sound strange to you, but it's not unusual at all. My daughter, Leilani, likes to paint. She's very talented, and I, I very much appreciate that about her. And one day she said, hey, mom, can I paint the case of your phone for you? Now, I mean, yeah, of course you can paint my phone case. Who would say no to that? And she said, well, what do you want on it? And I said, I don't know, just just something that says me, something that when I look at it, I say, wow, the person who made that, they really get it. They get me, they understand me. So just make something like that. I don't know what it is, just make it absolutely me. And she was like, oh, all right, sure. Anyway, when she was done and I got this phone case, I, I was just thrilled. And it's gone through a little bit of love and affection, I suppose, but let me just show you what she's done. She did a heart around the word family. And she used little green hearts all through because she knows my favorite color is green. And then she did words like fair, patience, love, hope, joy, soul, help, and Jesus. When it was done, I wasn't like, oh my goodness, phone case, you're amazing. You are what I have always wanted. I didn't even know I wanted you. You are the greatest phone case ever. And I will, I will show you to all people because you are an amazing phone case. And oh, wow, do I appreciate you. Yeah, no, that's not what happened. <laughs> what happened is I said, wow, Leilani, the artist, this is exactly what I didn't know I wanted. And when I get the chance, I do tell people, wow, look at what a great artist my daughter is. But even more importantly than that, look at how well my daughter knows me <laughs> because she made the perfect case for me. And it's the same thing about God's creation. You can look around at the things that God has made and say, this is so well done. God, you are brilliant. You are creative. You are amazing. I love the way that you created air and sound waves and animals. You are a brilliant God. But what I don't say is, tree, I love you. You solved all the problems of my life. Yeah, yeah. So that is where the thunderstorm of confusion comes in. Some people who don't know about God or don't want to know about God will praise the things that God has made instead of praising God himself. All right, so our lost city found was actually it's kind of deceptive to put it in this list because it's, it wasn't a lost city. What happened was that there was a Viking village called Dorvik. And when the Romans invaded England, they just built over top of this Viking settlement and they created the town that is now called York in England. I'm sure you've all heard of Vikings. If any of you have ever seen Lyle the Kindly Viking, the Veggie Tales movie, you know what a Viking is. This Viking village, Viking settlement, that was uncovered when people were digging in a basement. <laughs> a lot of the artifacts that the archaeologists discovered were very well preserved. They found metals, they even found cloth. We're talking over a thousand years ago. They have found over 40,000 artifacts and they have made this site a tourist attraction. One really cool thing about this place is I have been there. I have seen this tourist attraction. So what they've done is they've put glass over top of part of the old Viking village and you can walk over it and look down into the Viking village, into the parts that they have excavated. But they've also made it a tour. So you sit in this hanging cage, it carries you like a, like a roller coaster ride or a theme ride 
all around underground and it stops at certain places and you can watch these mannequins move and you can see them taking care of animals. You can see how their hospital was. You can see all sorts of really cool things. And once you come out, there's a museum and you can see somebody making a coin. In fact, if you give them a coin, they'll hammer it with this mold that they use and they will make you a Viking coin or a Viking replica coin. Every single year, they hold a Viking festival. One neat historical fact is that in 954 AD, the very last Viking king was killed shortly after a battle and his name was Eirik Bloodaxe. All right, kids, I know you're going to find this incredibly fascinating. One of the most famous artifacts that they discovered in Jorvik is poo. Yes, human excrement. And believe it or not, it was found pretty much intact, encased in clay, and they have studied this poo. Yes, I am saying poo. And no, I'm not showing you a picture of it, although you can look up a picture of this Viking poo. It is famous. <laughs> and the, there are actually people who study ancient poo. These people are called Paliscatologists. Dr. Andrew Jones, one of these poo studying scientists, said, This is the most exciting piece of excrement I've ever seen. In its own way, it's as irreplaceable as the crown jewels. <laughs> so, our little disc that you're going to put on your treasure map is. We find God in his awesome creation. Now, for those of you here at the church, you're going to have this little disc in with all your craft supplies that you took into the sanctuary. For those of you at home, you can click on the link below and print it out. And what you're going to do is you're going to stick this on the treasure map. This week, when you do your map, here's our map so far. We've done... We find God when we search for him. We've done, we find God in our family. We find God in our friendships. We find God in our everyday. And this week we're going to put, we find God in his awesome creation. Now to do that, you're gonna want a cotton ball, if you have one. If you don't have a cotton ball, well, that's not a problem. Just color the lightning bolt and your clouds don't have to be white. You can do them gray or black because God is with us even in the storms, right? The storms of our lives, they don't separate us from God. Sometimes that's when we see God the most, obviously, is when we're struggling and he sees us through the hard times in life. So if you have a cotton ball, this is a super fun thing to do. You take your cotton ball. I'm going to take a brand new one over here. And you just, you pull it apart and you stick that where the cloud would be using some white glue. Now, for those of you who are here at the church right now and you're thinking, hey, Meredith, you didn't give me any white glue. <laughs> you're so right, I did not. I didn't think white glue would be a really great idea for the sanctuary. So what I did instead is I glued some cotton balls on some discs for you and you can color in the lightning yourself. And glue it on the thunderstorm of confusion, remembering that God is the maker of creation. And it is God we praise, not nature or creation itself. For those of you who are here at the church on Sunday, I wanna remind you that there are 13 weeks and any kid who comes back to me at the very end and you have glued 13 discs on your chart, any, every kid is going to get a prize. So I'm going to glue, we find God through his awesome creation. 
here on the thunderstorms of confusion and we have found a way to get bible child through the thunderstorm of confusion by finding god in his awesome creation the goblin shark the goblin shark is not extinct but it is fascinating the goblin shark is so cool to me because it can take part of its jaw and shoot it forward in order to catch a fish so you can see the difference between uh, when its jaw is is back and relaxed and when it is hunting with its jaw forward goblin sharks are are found along at the bottom of the ocean along continental shelves near japan they can grow four meters long although they're not often found that big and one really cool thing about this shark is it's pink it is a pink shark although they have tried to raise some of them in captivity it's never been successful as soon as you put them not as soon when you put them into captivity they don't survive and they die but this is what scientists think they think it's very slow the only really fast thing about them is when they shoot that jaw forward to catch a fish when they have examined the stomach contents of goblin sharks they have found fish and octopus and squid and crabs and things like that it has a very long long tail and a snout and the eyes of the goblin shark are teeny tiny in fact because the goblin shark lives so deep in the ocean the eyes are pretty much useless they're very weak and they hunt using other methods rather than sight. They call the kind of feeding that the goblin shark does, they call it the slingshot method because it slings that part of its jaw forward and grabs the fish and eats it. The slingshot feeding method. I think as we get better at traveling below the surface of the ocean, we'll get better at studying deep ocean animals. But until that time, enjoy the facts about the goblin shark. Everything in nature was made by God. It says in the Bible that God spoke and things were made. That God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants, and trees on the land that bear fruit. And then at the end of that day, he looked out and he said, yeah, that's good. I would agree with you, God, those are good. And that was on the third day, each day, for almost a week, God dedicated to creating something new by simply speaking it into being. It says he created light and dark and water and the sky and the ground and the fish and the animals and the plants and the birds and the people. Oh yes, everything in nature was made by God. I think that's super cool. We are going to talk quite a bit about trees because yes, God made trees and trees are pretty cool. And trees are so different. Thousands of different kinds of trees all around the world. And they're different from the color of their bark to the shape of their leaves, to the kind of soil they will grow in, to the kind of climate where they will grow. Some of them grow flowers, some grow fruit, some grow nuts, some grow pine cones. The variety of tree out there is, is astonishing. And you can look at the beauty of a tree. But what we don't do is praise the tree itself. The tree itself really had no part in its own creation. It didn't decide it was going to grow apples instead of lemons that year. It didn't decide that it was going to grow in Canada instead of Botswana. It didn't decide any of those things. God created it to grow a certain way and to bear a certain fruit. But we do not worship the tree. In the end, we have to give acknowledgement that God made the tree and that God is awesome. And when you look at things in nature and they dazzle you, that is something to praise God about. In many cultures, people praise nature itself. Instead of praising the God who made the possibility of nature, they praise nature itself. There are cultures that worship snakes cultures that worship animals, cultures that worship the seasons, 
God created us to praise him and thank him for the beauty of nature. But we're praising him. We're not praising nature. And as we travel through our map, so we're in the thunderstorm of confusion, as we travel through that, we're starting to understand that God is the creator and God is amazing and God is worthy to be praised. And not to be confused between the artist, God, and the art, nature. What is a great way to appreciate nature? i give you a second or two to really think about that. What are some great ways to show God that you appreciate nature? Well, wait, I'll wait. I'll give you a second to think about it. Think, think, think. How do I show God? How do I appreciate nature? How do I appreciate nature? Let's see if I answer some of the things that you're thinking of. One way to show God that you appreciate his beautiful creation is to grow something yourself. Another way is to take care of our planet. Thank him. <laughs> That's a great way to show God that you appreciate nature. I love how the Bible says that in the beginning there was just God and then God spoke and he created things with the power of his voice. I love that. He created things like the sun and the moon and the planets. He created air. He created trees. He created animals. He created water. I mean the miracle of creation is mind-blowing how awesome is God's creation now I don't know about you guys but I know that I have had to make things I have had to make science projects I've had to make artwork I have had to make all sorts of stuff I have never had to make something that had never been made before I mean, obviously my artwork was original, it was my own artwork, but I mean the concepts of circles and squares or flowers and trees or butterflies and zebras and dragons, I mean those concepts have been thought of way before I was born. So, and, uh, so when I think about it and I, I made this artwork and it's all based on other things, even color, right? Just think, in the beginning there was no color. So if you have ever tried to make something on your own, you know that sometimes you do a really good job, sometimes not so great. So for those of you who are here at the church this Sunday and you're watching this video in the sanctuary, you have a little bag with some pipe cleaners and elastics. And I'm gonna show you what that's for. For those of you at home who do not have these things, go and get them. If you have some pipe cleaners, go and grab them and some elastics. Pause the video. Take a look around. If you don't have elastics, you could probably do this without them. All right? I am going to make a tree, a new tree that doesn't already exist out there. Behold, the world's first Klanakta tree. That's right, the Klanakta tree grows only in Antarctica. Its roots grow from the ground of Antarctica, and then the trunk pushes its way persistently through the ice and snow until at last the trunk emerges. There you go, I created something. So using your pipe cleaners, you can create anything you want. Uh, you could create an animal, give it a fun name. You could create a plant or a geological anomaly or a new planet. You can build anything you want. Try your hand at creating. One of the greatest empires of all time is the empire of Egypt. Every person I've ever met has heard about the Egyptian empire. And this is why Egypt and Kush, earliest cultures to develop a system of writing down their history. 
A lot of people have what's called an oral history. The First Nations people of Canada existed for a very long time on oral history. But in Egypt, they discovered a way of keeping track of information by developing a system of writing called hieroglyphs. Even just a couple hundred years ago, people didn't know a lot about hieroglyphs. hieroglyphs. And the reason for that is because they couldn't read them until Napoleon Bonaparte of France invaded Egypt in 1799. And he gets stuck in Egypt. And he was making some repairs to a fort near the town of Rashid, used to be called Rosetta. They found a tablet. This tablet was written in three languages. And this tablet has become known as the Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone was written in ancient hieroglyphs, which nobody knew how to read. Ancient Egyptian had been a dead language for over 1,500 years. And although we had Egyptian history written out and available, nobody could read it. It was also written in ancient Greek. So there was also another Egyptian language called Demotic. So it was written in those three. So the Rosetta Stone was an amazing historical discover, and this is our treasure, not gold. Because the Rosetta Stone was found in 1799 by Napoleon's army, we were able to translate it and learn ancient Egyptian. And because of that, we know about Egypt's rulers. We know about Egypt's customs. We know about Egypt's history. We know about Egypt's religion. Because once we could translate that one tablet, the linguists were able to go back to other ancient Egyptian texts and translate them. And then they started to learn the other words and things started to make sense. And that is why everybody knows so much about Egyptian history today, thanks to the Rosetta Stone. It is time for the impact prayer. Today we are learning about God's creation and how we can be excited about and praise God for his creation, but we do not praise creation itself. And we're not going to get confused about those things. Father God, in Genesis, we learned that God created plants, trees, days, and nights, everything. And we praise you for our favorite things in creation. Lord, as we look out and see nature, and as we grow older and learn about nature, we ask that you would, that you would remind us that you are the creator. And we ask that you would show yourself to us in nature so that we can praise you and appreciate you for being an amazingly creative God. I confess, Lord, that sometimes the fact that you made nature, the fact that you made all of the things that we have around us in nature, I confess that sometimes I don't praise you for it. In fact, sometimes, God, I forget. I don't even think about how amazing your creation truly is. And I confess that sometimes I forget to look for you in creation. Thank you, God, for your amazing creation. Thank you, God, for the things I love the most in creation. Thank you for showing yourself to me by showing me the world that you have created. In Jesus' name, amen. We are nearing the end of our trip through the thunderstorm of confusion. And I hope that you understand now how it's really important to praise God for his creation and not to praise creation itself and not to get confused between the artist and the art. So here we have our treasure box. And every week in the treasure box, we put something to remind us of the things that we've learned. So week one, which was remember to look for God if you want to find him. We have a map. Week two, 
We find God through our family. For that one, I put in a picture. Oops, an upside down picture. A picture of my grandma Marjorie to remind me that I find God in the relationships in my family. Week three, I find God in my friendships. This is the friendship bracelet that my friend Danielle and I made when we did that week. And I put it in here to remind me to find God in my friendships and to pick godly friends. Then last week we did, I find God everywhere, anywhere, anytime, doing anything. I am, do any, it doesn't matter what I'm doing, I will find God. And so I picked something mundane to put in to remind me that anything that I do, I can find God. Like using a pencil to write out a grocery list. Now this week we did, I find God in creation. And earlier in the video, I created my very own tree. <laughs> so I decided I'm going to put this in my remember box because God's creation is so much cooler than mine. But this reminds me that God created everything from his genius and his unending supply of creativity. So in my remember box this week, I have put the tree that I made. Well, we'll see you next week. Next week, we are going with Bible Child through the geyser of greatness, which doesn't sound actually very threatening, but I guess we'll see.